and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's great to have you with us. This week we're looking at Luke's version of Jesus giving his disciples the Lord's Prayer and some other instructions on what it means to pray while trusting fully in him. Before we dive into that, however, if you've not done so already, you might find it helpful to download the sheet that accompanies this study, and you'll find the link in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so, without further ado, let's dive into today's passage, which comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. Jesus was on the road from Galilee towards Jerusalem, having set his face to go there, as we heard in chapter 9, verse 51. And we know in the first 24 verses of chapter 10 that he had sent out 70 or 72, depending on your manuscript choice, um, disciples to prepare the way and um, proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God. And while he was on the road, working his way around to these places, the disciples had, had gone ahead of him. He encountered a lawyer who wanted to know how to gain eternal life, to which he responded by telling the parable of the Good Samaritan in chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And then finally in that chapter, as we thought about last week, he spent time in the house of Mary and Martha and talked about the kingdom of God being the top priority rather than those things that distract. So that's in verses 38 through to 42. And today's reading follows on from that and it's part of this travel narrative that takes us all the way from chapter 9 verse 51 right through to chapter 19 verse 27. And while it's called travel narrative, it actually includes a lot of Jesus' teaching, as we find in today's reading. So in this passage, we've got Jesus, who is preaching about the breaking in of the kingdom of God, as he makes his final, albeit rather roundabout, journey towards Jerusalem. And the disciples who are with him include, but are not limited to, the twelve. And the people who, as they were journeying along, it seems, wanted to know all about prayer and Jesus to teach them how to pray. Now, Luke's Gospel was the third of the four canonical Gospels to be written, around 80 to 85 of the Common Era. And it's interesting to compare the account that we find in Luke of the giving of the Lord's Prayer and some of the subsequent teaching with that which we find in Matthew's Gospel. So Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13 give us an equivalent of the Lord's Prayer. And then chapter 7 verses 7 to 11, an equivalent of the teaching about asking, searching and knocking. So we've got a couple of parallels, but the parable that's in the middle of today's reading in verses 5 to 8 is unique to Luke's Gospel. So we have a mixture of different genres here. We have a prayer, a version of the Lord's Prayer. We have the parable of the persistent man. And finally, we have, as I say, these bits of teaching around prayer, around what you might call almost shamelessness in prayer, picking up on the theme of the parable, being prepared to pray boldly, having put one's trust in Jesus. So, as in what we found at the end of chapter 10, Luke doesn't specify where this particular scene actually occurs. He just talks about it being in a certain place where Jesus was praying. As we learn at the beginning of verse 1. And we're told in the latter part of that verse that when he'd finished, his disciples approached him and asked to be taught how to pray. In the same way that John the Baptist, who was the older cousin and forerunner of Jesus, had taught his disciples to pray. And it reminds us that both men attracted discipleship movements to themselves. The remainder of this passage really is teaching all about prayer and it falls into three sections, as I've already hinted. 
So we begin by thinking about verses 2 to 4, Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. And it begins with an absolutely key word. The disciples are encouraged whenever they pray, we hear about the beginning of verse 2, to refer to God as Abba, as Father. Because of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they, and indeed us today, are able to stand where Jesus stands, to share that relationship that Jesus has with the Father. So we're able to call God Father and to enter into that same sort of intimate bond. We are called immediately after addressing God as Father, as we see in the next part of verse 2, to recognise the holiness of God's name. God hallows God's name. God glorifies God's self as another way of putting it. And it might remind us of those aspects of the Ten Commandments referenced in Exodus 20 verse 7 or Deuteronomy 5 verse 11 about not misusing the name of God. There's also in this verse a petition for the kingdom that Jesus has been inaugurating in his very person to come. And that gives us a kind of eschatological hint because we're living in a now and not yet time. The kingdom of God has been breaking in in the person of Jesus, but it's not yet come in all of its fullness with all of that will mean. And so we're praying to move from that partial in breaking through to that fullness of being in the life of the kingdom. Verse three shows the disciples being told to ask for their daily bread. That shows us on the one hand that God really cares about our material needs and about us as whole people. God cares about our bodies just as much as our minds and our spirits, as much as we sometimes neglect the former aspect. But also it shows us that we're supposed to ask for as much as we need for that day. We're not meant to be greedy and to stockpile and take more and more and more than we need. And that recalls, I would argue, Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 to 21, when the people that God had brought out of slavery in Egypt into their period of wilderness wandering before entering the promised land were provided with manna from heaven and they were only supposed to take what they needed for any particular day. And finally here, in verse 4, Jesus calls his followers to seek forgiveness of God as that from God, as they in turn forgive those who are indebted to them. In a society where the poorest often found themselves in debt, this was a really socially significant bit of teaching, indeed in many ways it still is today. And reference to the time of trial at the end of verse 4 is another eschatological hint. It's about the eschatological trials and tribulations that Luke 21 verses 5 to 38 hint at will come as God's kingdom comes in all of its fullness. So being saved from those trials and tribulations. So there's an awful lot packed in to those two verse, three verses rather. And it's really interesting, as I say, to compare the emphases in Luke with those in Matthew, an earlier version thereof. And the Lord's Prayer that we often pray today in our church life is a kind of amalgamation of these different versions. Having offered this prayer the disciples can use, Jesus goes on to tell a parable, the parable of the persistent man. Now it begins by supposing that the hearer of the parable has a friend who receives an unexpected guest late at night. And they go and they wake up yet another friend and ask for a loan of three loaves of bread because it's midnight and they've got nothing to offer their guest and obviously nowhere's going to be open at that time to buy food. That's verses five and six. Now the friend who's been woken up violates the principles of hospitality. We might look at it and say, well, how unreasonable to disturb somebody at midnight with this kind of request. But in that culture where you are expected to help one another out and assist with offering hospitality to guests, it was actually this person who refused to get up that was in the wrong. It was not at all an unusual thing for someone to share a bed with other members of their family, hence this um, person who doesn't want to get up talks about being in bed with their children and they can't possibly get up and unlock the door and help in verse 7. And the etiquette of hospitality, as I say, puts them in the wrong. 
Yet it seems from verse 8 that they do eventually conform to expectations because of the boldness of the request that's been put before them. And that leads to the, um, the person who came a-knocking, as it were, getting what they need, verse 8. Now, the Greek term that the NRSV translates as persistence is perhaps better rendered as shameless. And it points to the boldness that we're able to show in prayer if we have that kind of familiarity with God. It's a boldness, it's a shamelessness in asking for what we need that we can do, exactly because we're able to refer to God as Father and stand where Jesus does. And that brings us to the final part of our reading in verses 9 to 13, which is a collection of Jesus' sayings. I would argue that this section is fundamentally about trust. Verses 12 and 13 make the point that we wouldn't give our own children bad things, dangerous things, like snakes and scorpions, when they've asked for good things like bread and fish. Interestingly, the very foods that were transformed into an abundance for many in the feeding of the 5,000. And so God, who is good in a way that human beings are not, we're a flawed mixed bag, will give the Holy Spirit in far greater abundance and willingness than we're necessarily willing to give. Now, in this reference to what you would do for your children, we again go back to this idea of God as our father, as our heavenly parent, if I could put it like that, who longs to take care of us and who longs to share the divine life with us, which is what it's on about when it talks in verses 12 and 13 about asking for the Holy Spirit and receiving that, as we see in verse 14. So, in trust, the disciples are encouraged to ask, to search, and to knock at the door, as we find in verses 9 to 10. Now, obviously, that's extremely challenging stuff, and it's a text that requires a lot of wrestling with. It raises the question of why is it that we may well put our trust in Jesus and ask for things in faith and seek him earnestly and yet not find him and find that our prayers are not answered. I don't think resorting to a glib response in this context is particularly helpful. It's very easy to start talking about God's plan or prayers being answered in ways we don't understand or sometimes God says no. Actually, it's far harder to sit in that trusting place, trusting that God is our Father and that God is on our side, God is for us, even when things don't work out how we'd ideally like them to. And that challenge really is fundamentally about trust. So we're encouraged to pray for very specific things that are about our fullness of life and our being part of community with others and with all creation. We're encouraged to be shameless, to be bold in what we pray for, and we're encouraged to put our trust in Jesus. And as we think about those things, we now move to our questions for this week.